Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the sixth, that's right, the sixth uh, in a series of LaRouche Pack classes on LaRouche's method and approach to the science of physical economy and creativity. Uh, the last class will be given by Jason Ross on, we appreciate his doing this on short notice, um, on Vernatsky from LaRouche's perspective. And before we get to that, I would like to just say a few things to situate where we are because it really is the case if you think about what's happening in the world and you think about what's happening in the United States, we are at an inflection point, a point of extreme tension between the breakthroughs of the initiative launched by China in 2013, the One Belt, One Road initiative, which in a set, very direct way is an, um, I can't exactly say a result, but it is part of the process of the fight waged by Lyndon and Helga Zepp LaRouche going back really about 50 years or more. Uh, in LaRouche's case, as a veteran of World War II, it was very clear in his mind what the intent of Franklin Roosevelt was for the post-war world. And Franklin Roosevelt was rather explicit, as we now know in his meetings with Winston Churchill, that the United States was not engaged in fighting fascism and military dictatorships for the purpose of allowing the hideous policies of British, Dutch, French colonial methods to be continued and perpetrated, but that at the end of the war, it was FDR's intention that every single nation should have its independence, and that you had to create a global economic system which was just, that while every nation might be of different size, different length of uh, historical culture, language, etc., that there had to be a certain equality of voice, of representation. This was his conception in founding the United Nations. Uh, and that nations had to be allowed through a system of fixed exchange rates, low interest credit, to be able to develop what LaRouche used to call a full set economy. Emphatically that every nation had the right to develop its own machine tool and scientific capability to be self-sufficient. Uh, that does not mean that you would not have trade and exchange because of course that's what makes the human species so rich and such great potential. So of course the British prolonged the war to the point that FDR died before the war ended. You had Herbert Hoover and his McCarthy witch hunts going on in the United States. You had a little President Truman who was a real Anglophile and FDR's vision did not come into being. But we have an opportunity now where about two-thirds of the world's population is engaged in such progress and the crucial battleground of this is which way the United States goes. And that is why the effort by the British to destroy President Trump, to terminate his presidency, and to surround him with people who could prevent his intention to, for example, end perpetual wars, why they are so desperate to do that. And as people may know who've been keeping up with Barbara Boyd's writings, it is now public in the British House of Lords report from last December that the British House of Lords has determined that the special relationship between the United States and the British Empire maybe will survive one term of President Trump but cannot survive two terms of President Trump. And therefore it is the explicitly publicly stated policy of the British to ensure that this president does not serve a second term. That's the fight. Uh, our intent is that the United States joins with this process of the Belt and Road, which is the natural outcome of LaRouche's life's work over these last 50 years, and which is very much potential. And I'd like to reference President Trump's State of the Union address, which I think was quite extraordinary. There were many so-called 
facts which were not correct in what he said. And I think this is somewhat of a poetical paradox because like a musical composition, perhaps the result of the performance is not in your playing every single note correctly, but is in the intent that comes across. And what President Trump said at the outset was that we are at a moment of unlimited potential which is absolutely true. It is not the way most Americans think right now. Um, and that it is incumbent upon the Congress and the American people to decide whether we wish to be engaged in partisan identity politics or other kinds of divisive, silly bickering on minor issues, or if we are going to unite ourselves to move forward for the betterment of mankind and for the United States to play the role that was intended by our founding fathers. Um, and there were some specific things in Trump's address and in his choice of guests that I think are very indicative. One is his statement that great nations do not engage in perpetual wars. And as people may know, we have already begun the withdrawal of our troops from Syria, which so greatly upset the Wall Street and British controllers of the U.S. Senate that they felt it necessary to vote on and pass in the Senate. I think it was 63 to 28. I mean, really outrageous. A resolution calling for no uh, precipitous, or whatever the word is, uh, that this is abrupt action. Now, we've been in Afghanistan 19 years. We've been in Syria for, I don't know, five years. Rand Paul correctly said 17 years of war is not precipitous action. Uh, but, I mean, this is the kind of outrage. So it's incumbent, I think it's incumbent that people take the challenge of the president as a personal matter, that we have to act, that the Congress demonstrates repeatedly that on their own they will do the wrong thing. And therefore, it is for the American people to get your intellectual pitchforks and get yourself on the case. And part of the point of this class series is that you want to have your pitchfork pointed in the right direction, and you want it to be sharpened. Um, now, there's a few... Um, and just on that, I didn't want to say much about it, but I guess I have to reference it. Uh, there's this so-called Green New Deal thing that's being introduced. And really, the thing is about as credible as my proposing that we go to the Hudson River and lay the foundation for a new super mall in the mist that is on top of the river in the morning. It's it completely has no bearing. It's insane. It won't work. And even uh, Senator Markey, after he saw the fact sheet put out by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, had to distance himself from her and that fact sheet because she's saying that we will have no nuclear power. Nuclear power is, of course, carbon-free. Not that no one, not that anyone has proven that there's a correlation between carbon emissions and global temperature rise, which we're not even measuring accurately because we don't have uh, thermometers in evenly spaced locations on the planet. And we've taken a sample. The article I saw in the paper said, we've been measuring the temperature for 139 years, and this is the warmest on record. Well, the planet's been here for about 4 billion years. So if you want to take a sample you can t try yourself of how you personally felt one second ago and map that on the entirety of your life, um, you can see that maybe that's not the most significant thing that you ever thought of. So the thing is just a complete fraud. It's ridiculous. The Democratic Party, if they go with this, is, you know, um, someone said they have a policy now of killing babies instead of kissing babies. Um, Etc. If if the party wants to go with this, it's collective suicide, and it's it doesn't work. The question is, can can you can the people here demonstrate for your friends and colleagues 
why this is a fraud and why the kind of initiatives announced just, I guess, yesterday by the Russians of a planned uh, manned landing on the moon, I think in 2030 or 2034, and the head of NASA, um, Bridenstine, just said that the United States is going back to the moon and this time to stay, which is very important, why this is absolutely the right policy and why there is no contradiction between doing these things, making these scientific breakthroughs, and addressing the eradication of poverty on planet Earth, which actually is quite related and which we will not do if we don't also get to the moon. So I think I will stop here. Let me just say that if you have questions, if you're listening online, here in the room, we can take questions right here at this microphone afterwards, and we'd ask people to at least say your first name and where you're from, what city or what part of the city. Um, online, it's classes at larouchepack.com. So if you're listening live and you have a question, classes at larouchepack.com. We'll get your questions and be able to answer them. And now I'm going to turn this over to Jason Russ. Thanks, Diane. I'm really glad uh, we've got a nice full crowd here today, and I believe we have also Houston online with us and people watching on YouTube. Welcome to everyone. Um, this is the sixth in the series of classes, and we've covered a lot over the course of these classes leading into the Schiller Institute conference next weekend. The theme has been on LaRouche's mind's relationship to other great minds in history in the context of understanding his proposal for a new Bretton Woods. So just to review, we've heard from Bruce Director about how the universe is inherently anti-entropic, that the second law of thermodynamics is not a universal principle, certainly not if you include human beings in the universe, which I think we should. We're here. <laughs> we heard about Johannes Kepler, the first modern scientist, and how LaRouche looked to his work as a way of understanding what causes a planetary orbit and of understanding an economy in terms of the principles that govern the orbit of the economy? What are the ideas that cause an economy to move forward? We've heard about Nicholas of Cusa, the creator of the European Renaissance, the concept of the nation state. We heard from John Seegerson about the relationships between culture, the truthfulness or beauty in culture, music, and the relationship of that to science. And we heard last week a great presentation from Will Wirtz on Friedrich Schiller and on the state of mind that's most associated with creating revolutionary progress, the sublime. What we're going to do today is hear about and learn about Vladimir Vernadsky. Vernadsky is a, a Russian scientist. He also spent part of his life in Ukraine. He created the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. He set up Russia's, the Soviet Union's uh, nuclear research program. He created the National Library of Ukraine. He was a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. He did a lot. He is as well known in Russia as you might expect people to know about Einstein in many parts of the world. Very famous scientist. And what we're going to look at is the analogs between LaRouche's understanding of economics and what Vladimir Vernadsky called the noosphere which is, I suspect, a new term to many here, and we're going to discuss what that is. Vernadsky also developed the concept of the biosphere. So we'll talk about that. We'll get into it. So similar in both LaRouche and Vernadsky is an understanding that the universe is actually composed of three phase spaces and that it's useful and necessary to consider these as being somewhat distinct. We've got the world of non-living phenomena. Right? We have geology, we have chemistry, we have physics. We have the world of living matter. This includes, of course, life. It includes, over the long term, evolution. And we have cognition. We create a noosphere, a domain of physical changes on the Earth and beyond as a result of our thought, just as life has created changes on the planet through its actions. The creation of the atmosphere, the creation of oxygen, in the atmosphere. That was a new thing. We didn't have that before photosynthesis. All of these kinds of changes. So I'd actually like to ask and see if anybody would like to volunteer to their mind any differences that um, 
that they believe exist. Well, well, we'll come to it. I want to get some thoughts in a moment. First off, let's just start with the fact that the human species is unlike any other species. We've increased our population. We've transformed our environment. We've transformed our relationship to the environment, or even what we consider to be the environment. If you're living tens of thousands of years ago, your environment might be the woods, the plains, just your, your surroundings, natural surroundings. Today, we're in New York, right here. Most of the environment we interact with is nothing you would call natural. The subway was not built because lava flowed through a tube and left it there. Right? We're in a building, we've got electricity, you took a bus, you took a train, however you got here. We, our environment is increasingly man-made, and we're going to see how similar that is to evolution. Now, how did we accomplish this? Some people, if you ask them what makes people different from animals, some people tell me that it's about our biology. Aristotle, the unjustly famous Greek philosopher, said that what makes us better than the animals is our sense of touch. Has anybody else heard any other ideas of what physically makes us different from animals? Okay, I saw this. Opposable thumbs. Has anybody heard this? That what makes us special is our thumbs? Okay. Now, if, let's say, someone was born without a thumb or lost it in an unfortunate accident, wouldn't they still be a human? Also, I hate to shock you, but what do you see on this creature? Yeah, okay, that's not even a monkey. Anyone know what that is? That's a koala bear. There are frogs with opposable thumbs. So I don't know who came up with this opposable th thumb thing, but it's about as stupid as Aristotle saying our sense of touch is what made us human. It sort of leaves a bit of a paradox, though. What, if it's nothing really physical about us, what is it that makes our species so different? Here's something that Vernonsky had to say about it, about the amazing fact that our thoughts have power. Vernonsky says, there exists now on the terrestrial surface a great geological force, perhaps cosmic. This force does not seem to be a new manifestation or special form of energy, nor yet a pure and simple expression of known energy. But it exerts a, power, a profound and powerful influence on the course of energetic phenomena on the Earth's surface, and consequently has repercussions smaller but undeniable, beyond the surface, on the existence of the planet itself. This force is human reason, the directed and controlled will of social man. This is a force, a physical force. Well, a not entirely physical force. So let's, uh, I want to get into this, but I'd like to hear some thoughts about any ideas about what is different about non-living processes, living processes, cognitive processes? You can shout it out and I'll repeat. Into the, anybody have any thoughts? Any differences between any of them? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, for those who couldn't hear, including online, we heard that one of the aspects of life is breathing, respiration, or maybe I'd say metabolism, um, that bacteria metabolize. They use oxygen. Viruses don't, and this is a difference between them. Any other differences that come to anyone's mind? Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, we have things that aren't alive. And usually we can tell, I mean, maybe if something's like almost dead, you can't tell if it's alive or dead. But if you see a rock versus a plant, usually it's pretty easy for us to identify something's living, something isn't. Well, Vernadsky took, he didn't actually try to define life. He said, let's look at living matter. Just like you might, 
he started some of his research working under a, a soil scientist. So he was looking at a lot of minerals and things like this. So he said, let's look at an organism almost maybe like a, like a geological process in the small. What does living matter do? What does it accomplish? One thing that Bruce Director had brought up in the first class was about the direction of time. So in the non-living world, entropy is used as a way of measuring the direction that time progresses. That entropy never decreases and that this gives time a direction that makes forward and backward in time different from left and right in space. Left and right in space are just opposites, but forward and backward in time aren't just opposites. There really is something different about them. Time goes in one direction. In living matter, Vernadsky pointed out a different kind of time. You have the time of an organism. You know, it eats food, it releases its wastes, it takes breaths, these kinds of things. But what about evolutionary time? How do we understand the change in species over evolutionary time? And then, well, we'll come to, we'll come to cognition. So let's look at what some of the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has a self kind of uh, sur survival kind of what's the word? Uh, instinct, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there, life adapts to surroundings. It tries to survive. It's interesting the way that one one individual living thing might try to live in certain surroundings. The way life relates to surroundings. One individual organism can change its behavior. Life can actually change what kind of living matter exists. The move to land, for example. If all life was in the sea and then it comes to land, it's not like the jellyfish just changes its behavior a little bit. It's, it, you know, it's no longer a jellyfish, it's just different. So that's something that happens over, over biological time. Vernonsky talked about how the biosphere reshaped the Earth as a whole. I'd mentioned the creation of the atmosphere. There are certain um, crystals or rocks that also could only exist because of life, like granite, which actually could never have existed without all the oxygen created by photosynthesis. So pretty big, big scale changes. Let's look at, uh, okay, yes, last one. I just wondered, uh, what about radioactive elements? Okay. I mean, they give off energy. Mm -hmm. They almost make, it begs the question, are they living processes or not? Okay, okay, good question. Are radioactive elements living? They're doing something. Okay, let's keep these in mind and let's look at some of the ways that Vernadsky measured this. And then, of course, we're going to pull this into LaRouche and economics and what we need to accomplish with the new Bretton Woods. So here is one of Vernadsky's principles of living matter. He said, the second biogeochemical principle can be formulated thus. The evolution of species leading to the creation of new, stable living forms must move in the direction of an increase in the biogenic migration of atoms in the biosphere. Let me just stop to define that. So biogenic, bio life, genic, you know, created by migration of atoms. In other words, to what extent are atoms moving around as a result of life? Like you eat, you go find some food, you just move that atom into your body, and then later when it's, you're done with it, it's gonna go somewhere. That's part of the biogenic migration of atoms. This indicates, in my opinion, with an infallible logic, the existence of a determined direction in the sense of how the process of evolution must necessarily take place. All theories of evolution must take into consideration the existence of this determined direction of the process of evolution. There's some people who say that we are just as, that human beings are just as advanced as tapeworms because we both exist in the present and therefore we both have ecological niches. The amount of the biogenic migration of atoms caused by human beings is much greater than that of tapeworms. We're going to see some charts about this. Vernonsky says it's also evident that the evolution of species is correlated with the structure of the biosphere. Neither life nor the evolution of its forms would have been able to exist independently of the biosphere, nor to be divided from it 
as separated natural entities. You can't look at one living organism outside of the biosphere that it lives in and affects. In biogeochemical processes, it is indispensable to take into consideration the following numerical constants. The mean mass of an organism, its mean elementary chemical composition, and its mean geochemical energy. That is to say, the facility with which it produces displacements, otherwise called the migration, of chemical elements in the living environment. Just like you might ask, what's the energy use of a certain country or city, you, might, you can say, what is the energy use, what is the mean geochemical energy of a kind of living matter? Are birds more energetic than lizards, for example? And over evolutionary time, Bernanski is saying that this increases. So there are three kinds of biogenic migration of atoms, according to Bernanski. First, during its life, the living organism is an incessant current, a whirlpool of atoms which come from its exterior and return there. The organism lives as long as this current, this flow of atoms subsists. Living matter has a constant exchange with its surroundings. If that's, not, if that's no longer happening, it's, there's no life. Two, the intensity of the biogenic current of atoms and changes in life that allow this. We're looking at evolutionary time. And three, due to technological development. The migration of atoms that is not purely through the body and metabolism, like gophers, making tunnels, termites, building mounds, and obviously human beings. So just this last point of his again. The evolution of species leading to the creation of new stable forms must move in the direction of an increase in the biogenic migration of atoms in the atmosphere. Evolution has a direction, he believes. It's not purely random. Something is increasing over time. Let's look at some examples of this. So. Um, here you see different, you see some words that might be unfamiliar since, you know, eighth grade or something. So we have fern-like plants as the darkest green, gymnosperms are light green, and angiosperms are the yellow. The way to read this chart, these different things aren't in, in front of each other. Rather, at any point, if you take a, I'll, I'll point one out. So what we've seen is over time, the ferns, well, they were the top, then the gymnosperms, then the angiosperms. So ferns don't have seeds. They don't do great in dry areas like on land. It's a little bit tough. You've got to be really moist if you want to go through life as a fern. No seeds. G <laughs> gymnosperms, this is like a pine tree. They have seeds. What do they not have? They don't have any flowers. They don't have any fruit. Angiosperms are the most advanced plants. So an apple or a cherry or this kind of tree, maple tree, this kind of thing. These are angiosperms. And so we've seen over evolutionary time, you see on the bottom is millions of years, a change in the kinds of plants that make up the biosphere. Also, this is a chart of how much energy those plants use. So per mass, you can see the gymnosperms use less energy, the angiosperms move, use more. Over evolutionary time, the types of plants that make up most of the plant material on the planet are becoming more advanced, more energetic, and more tasty. How many pine tree type things do people eat? Compared to how many flowering plants do we eat? Mm -hmm. They make fruits, and you can also just eat them, like a carrot. Okay, good. So now let's look at animal life. Here you can see on this chart the amount of calories, the, me the metabolic rate, how many calories do different organisms use over time. And in this chart, you can see in the x direction, the horizontal direction, is how big the animal is. So bigger animals use less calories per hour per 
mass. But you can see is that reptiles use less than lizards. Salamanders use less than all reptiles. Mammals use more energy. Birds use more energy. If you have five pounds of bird just existing, compared to five pounds of mammal, the bird is going to use more energy during its life. It's hard to fly. The chart on the right, not to overwhelm you, is similar to the one about plants, where the yellow is amphibians. So way back when, the amphibians were the main animals. Then the green, the reptiles, became most dominant. Then birds and mammals are now most of the kinds of four-legged creatures that exist on this planet. So the biosphere, again, is moved in a direction of higher energy, of greater flow of energy, a greater rate of biogenic migration of atoms. Even among mammals, we got some weird mammals here on the right. And I'll just say that, again, over evolutionary time, ones like us, placental mammals, we use more energy than the ones with pouches, the marsupials. This is why there aren't really very many marsupials left. They just don't do nearly as well as the more advanced placental mammals. When the Isthmus of Panama, when the, when the land bridge between North and South America opened up, South America mostly had marsupials, like Australia. While all the placental mammals from North America invaded and basically wiped out all of the marsupials, except for opossums. They're pretty much the only marsupial that's still around. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I think I have enough charts. Sea creatures also change in the direction of more energy. Okay, we got it. Yeah, okay. Last thing, more predators compared to non-predators. That is, life over time, more and more of the kinds of life that exist are kinds that actually seek out their food as opposed to um, just, uh, you know, it's not hard to catch a plant. It's a lot harder to hunt another animal. Okay? Good. Okay, that's enough. So anyway, overall evolution has got a direction. And times of big upheaval, like the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, it wasn't just that the dinosaurs disappeared, so did most of the brachiopods, ancient sea creatures. They also, pff, they went off a cliff at this exact same time. Um, actually, in an earlier time. So overall, evolution has got this, this change to it. It has a direction. Let's look at human society. Just like we saw the different kinds of plants, ferns, gymnosperms, angiosperms, we've seen the kind of energy that we use change in a similar way, US energy use. Wood, antique. Coal, more modern. Oil, natural gas, more energy, more you can do with it. Nuclear. This is the evolutionary step that's being halted right now. It's sort of like the, uh, the environmentalists are telling sea creatures trying to you know, colonize the land, oh no, we've got to preserve the land the way it is. You need to stay in the ocean. We need to keep the land unsoiled by life. Stay off. But just to remind, so here's more about human society. This is a chart. Energy consumption, GDP. Here's one, electricity consumption. Infant mortality. Okay. So let's take a look at what LaRouche has to say about this and how we'll pull this into economics. So he says, the most significant thing in my pointing to the referent excerpts from Vernadsky's 1935 report on methods of biogeochemistry is the way in which he structures the process of discovery of that principle, which separates the biosphere categorically from a part of the universe which is determined only by principles of non-living processes. LaRouche is saying, he's saying, let's draw attention to how did Vernadsky make this discovery? How did he think about living matter? So, and, and here are some of the quotes from Vernadsky that LaRouche is referring to. An organism does not show a passive attitude towards the chemical medium. It actively creates atomic composition. It tends to choose, consciously or unconsciously, the chemical elements necessary for life. But as life presents a field of dynamic equilibria, it reflects, both in its composition and in its form, the different physical chemical properties of the medium. 
life is continuously and immutably connected with the biosphere. It is inseparable from the biosphere, materially and energetically. The living organisms are connected with it through their nutrition, breathing, reproduction, and metabolism. This connection may be precisely and fully expressed quantitatively by the migration of atoms from the biosphere to the living organism and back again, the biogenic migration of atoms. The more energetic it is, the more intense is life. LaRouche took some of these quotes from Vernadsky where he contrasted the non-living with the living and LaRouche reshaped them to talk about the difference between reason and the non-living or the purely biological. So LaRouche altered Vernadsky to write this, the principle of creative reason is continuously and immutably connected with the noosphere and also the subsumed biosphere. It is inseparable from the latter materially and energetically. The living organisms are connected with the biosphere through their nutrition, breathing, reproduction, and metabolism. This connection may be precisely and fully expressed quantitatively by the migration of atoms from the biosphere to the living organism and back again the noogenic migration of atoms. The more energetic it is, the more intense is cognition. So, coming back to the difference between these three phase spaces, one thing that we've seen just from what we just saw was that biology has a direction to it, not just in the life of one organism from birth through death, but over longer periods of time. Over evolutionary time, we see another kind of biological process emerge, and it also has a direction, increasing biogenic migration, increasingly creating its own environment, increasingly determining what it's going to do. Early animals in the sea, like sponges, they couldn't swim around. Coral, it doesn't move, it just sits there more advanced life is able to go around, look for where it wants to go, change its environment and its relationship to it. Um, so let's talk about human thought then. Consciousness and thought, Bernadsky says, despite the effort of generations of thinkers, cannot be reduced either to energy or to matter. However we define these bases of our scientific thought, how can consciousness act on the work of natural processes which seem to be entirely reducible to energy and matter? It is probable that we will not be able to resolve this question until after having radically changed our fundamental physical notions, notions which have undergone and still undergo transformations with the rapidity for which we know of no prior examples in the history of thought. Part of this question is understanding free will. I've actually met a number of people who believe that free will can't exist because our minds are our brains, they say. Our brains are biological. Biology is, you know, biochemical. Chemistry is physical. And physics, there's laws of physics. So how can free will exist if everything is just determined the same way as if you, you, know, you throw a ball and you can calculate how it'll bounce? Isn't the mind completely calculable? If we had a supercomputer, could we predict what you would do in every circumstance? Now, advertisers do hope that they have some idea of how you'll react in every circumstance and how to program you. But does that fully encompass the mind? Is there no free will? Partly, Vernadsky is saying to resolve this, we're going to need new concepts, new very basic concepts uh, to make it through this. So, LaRouche again, what is most significant in my pointing to the referenced excerpts from Vernadsky's 1935 report is the way he structures the process of discovery of that principle which separates the biosphere from the non-living. LaRouche writes, we cannot see life in the physics of abiotic processes. We cannot see cognition, the distinction of the human individual from the beast, in the living matter of the human individual. You can't find cognition if you, somebody cuts you apart and looks for it. You're not going to find it somewhere, hidden in a lobe of the brain. You also, we don't see life in the physics of abiotic processes. There are some very basic concepts of life 
that have never been explained in physical chemical terms. I mean, until we make life entirely from scratch, we, we can't say that we have done that. One example is isomers, chemical compounds that are exactly identical except they're mirror images of each other in the way the atoms are arranged. Physical processes don't care. They're exactly equal chemically. In living processes, you have one or the other. They're different. How can you explain that biological difference chemically? We haven't. Dirichlet's principle, LaRouche writes, defines a class of physically efficient mental objects which are never perceived, but whose existence is efficiently demonstrated by crucial types of experiments. Life and cognition are higher qualities of expression of such objects. So just to say a bit about Dirichlet's principle, which is a really kind of complex matter and it needs a class on its own, this was a, a concept that was used by Bernard Riemann who had developed the real way to understand the shape of space instead of the Euclidean space. Bernard Riemann, in 1854, had explained exactly how it was that people who had made assumptions that space was flat, that the, some of the angles in a triangle would always be 180, that it was possible to create two parallel lines that never meet, that that wasn't a basis for thought that could really go anywhere. Let me ask, has anyone ever seen two parallel lines and verified that they never meet? You can imagine in your mind that happening. Does that really happen in the universe? And can you know by imagining? I've imagined all sorts of things. They didn't all happen. Okay? The same with the angles in a triangle. Yeah, on a flat plane, it seems that the angles in a triangle add up to 180. But again, if you take three points out in space, the sun, another star, another star, if you connect them, well, is the space in between them flat? You don't know until you try it. You can't just make the assumption. So Riemann had said, we've got to understand things based on the principles that cause relationships, not by imagined measurements. And one of the concepts Riemann used was Dirichlet's principle which says that in certain circumstances, you can know something completely without describing it as its particulars, without giving it a name or a formula. But if you know what it does, that itself is adequate to say, I ha this is a real thing. I don't know how the pieces work yet, or if it even has pieces, according to Dirichlet's principle, says Riemann. But by the effects that it has, I know that this is a real concept. And LaRouche says that this is what he sees in Vernadsky's explanations of life and of cognition. Vernadsky never defined life. He looked at what living matter does, the kinds of actions it engages in. But Vernadsky did not define life. He didn't try to define cognition. But he looked at what cognition does, at the increase in human population, at the increase in flow of materials that we're able to achieve by knowledge. So this is a very important aspect um, in LaRouche's view on this. So I now have probably what may be a somewhat reduced number of quotes, because I do have a, a few here. Um, but I think it's just great to actually get to, get to meet this guy. What we're going to focus on now is a few things more about what the noosphere is. What is it that the human mind does? Without defining creativity, what does it do? And then we'll come back to why the Green New Deal is crap and what we ought to do. Okay. So Vernadsky writes, we see that there lies an unbridgeable gulf between the physical chemical properties in living organisms and inert matter, non-living. Living matter is the bearer and creator of free energy. This free energy, biogeochemical energy, embraces the entire biosphere and fundamentally determines its entire history. During the past 10,000 years, a new form of this energy has been created, even more intense and complex and rapidly growing in importance. This new energy associated with human societies, while preserving the expression of ordinary biogeochemical energy, brings about new forms of migration of chemical elements, which in their diversity and power 
leave the ordinary biogeochemical energy of the living matter of the planet far behind. He gives us an example, aluminum. We move aluminum around when we mine it, but in a way far bigger than plants mine magnesium when they make chlorophyll. Totally big difference in the, in the scope of what power we have. This new form of biogeochemical energy, which might be called the energy of human culture, or cultural biogeochemical energy, is that form of biogeochemical energy which is now creating the noosphere. Energy isn't energy. Energy in coal is not the same as human cultural energy. We kind of use the same yardstick in a certain way, but they're not the same thing. This form of biogeochemical energy is proper not only to Homo sapiens, but to all living organisms. How is cultural energy common to all living organisms? Among these, this energy appears insignificant compared with ordinary biogeochemical energy and is barely noticeable in the balance of nature, and then only on the scale of geological time. It is associated with the mental activity of organisms, with the development of the brain in the higher forms of life, and only with the appearance of reason do its effects produce the form of transition of the biosphere into the noosphere. Its manifestation in the predecessors of man was probably developed over the course of hundreds of millions of years but was able to express itself as a geological force only in our time, when Homo sapiens has embraced the entire biosphere with his life and cultural work. So to what extent was the principle of cognition operating over the time of cephalization in evolutionary time? Cephalization is a term used by an American biologist, Dana, to talk about the fact that organisms started having heads. Cephalus means head, so cephalization. We got all of our sense organs here, or, you know, I mean, we have skin everywhere, but, you know, we have our other ones all in our head. We've got a, a brain in our head. So for organisms moving this way, is this getting ready to have a seat for reason? Is cognition expressing itself in this preparation? And if it is, the individual organisms over evolutionary time, they're not aware of this. Could this be the weak cultural biogeochemical energy development that Vernadsky is referring to? So, the mind can therefore be manifest to the maximum degree only under conditions of the maximum development of the fundamental form of human biogeochemical energy. That is, under the condition of man's maximum degree of reproduction. This noetic force, this power, only most powerfully expresses itself when we organize society around expressing it as much as we can. That is what has taken biology a very long time to accomplish, if biology accomplished it, the existence of a reasoning species on this planet, the way that that no noesis, that power of cognition will be most fully developed is when we maximize our maximum degree of reproduction. That doesn't mean having as much sex as possible. What that means is having the greatest possible rate of economic development through science, through beautiful culture, through understanding what it is that makes us all creative in this way. When we do that, we are maximizing our humanity, that which separates us from the animals. When we live in societies that don't progress, that are purely traditional, we are losing something of the human in ourselves. We're not made to be the same every single generation. You're really not being fully human if you do that. So, but what, you know, what does progress look like? The discovery of fire, Vernadsky writes, presents the first instance in which a living organism takes possession of and masters one of the forces of nature. Undoubtedly, this discovery lies, as we now see, at the foundation of mankind's subsequent future increase and of our present powers. The surface of the planet was radically changed 
after that discovery of fire. Everywhere sparkled, smoldered, and emerged a hearth of fire wherever man lived. Only in our day did man possess other sources of light and heat, electrical energy. The planet began to glow ever more, and we are presently at the beginning of a time whose significance and future remains now beyond our ken. Nuclear power was really just being developed in the last decades of Vernadsky's life. He talked about one of his friends who was trying to estimate the potential human population of the planet based on agriculture and coming at a number of about 22 billion people. When his friend then included the energy that we get from coal and oil and gas and these kinds of things, his estimate increased. After the discovery of nuclear power, his friend said, I really, you know, it's almost foolish to even try and make an estimate. But he made one, and it was in the trillions of people. All right, this is what, when we've got this amount of cultural biogeochemical energy, what we're capable of doing is just tremendous. So let's bring this now to judge economic policies, economic proposals. And let's talk about whether they're natural or not. What's the first word of Green New Deal? Why, why green? What does green symbolize? Plants. Nature. Money. <laughs> OK. Maybe we should ask which kind they meant, because this would cost a lot of money. I don't know. OK. <laughs> Good. And among plants, certainly not power plants. Yeah. So the Green New Deal says, you know, we've got to be natural. What's natural is, and then people have diff different definitions of natural, but usually people who say this think that it doesn't include human beings. That inherently we're unnatural. Usually the definition of natural means not human. Whatever would happen if we weren't here, that's natural. So unless we all kill ourselves, we'll never have a natural society, will we? I mean, that's just, that's what that means. Human beings are natural. We do, over a very short period of time, what the biosphere takes forever to do. Saying, thank goodness there's people now. You know how long it's taken me? Hundreds of millions of years to get from the water onto land, to make flowering plants so you'd have something to eat. Then we could have the mammals, you know, and because they, they have fruit and berries to eat. This is a lot of work. So it's a good thing you're here. Because if we had to wait for some comet to strike the Earth and knock off a chunk of it to go, go to some other system and land there to bring life there, that would take forever. Thank goodness there's people to do that. Whew. So we've got a responsibility to the universe <laughs> to be natural and do what nature does. Increase the flow of energy over time. Increase the different types of technologies that make that happen. That's what's natural. So I think we, you know, we've heard something about this. I, I love it. There's like these just two con contradictory signs held up here. OK. I, I see a sign that says, end poverty. And this woman, maybe she's protesting Ocasio-Cortez because she seems to be associated with the sign that says, Green New Deal. Now, I don't know which one you'd prefer. I'd much rather eliminate poverty than have a Green New Deal. But you, see, you can't do both. You can't do both. Let's look at why. Let's talk about, oh, yeah. Not everyone uh, agrees with this, of course. <laughs> Let's just talk a little bit about industry. Now, when we use energy in the US, you're told you got to conserve your energy. You know, don't leave the fridge open. Think of what you're going to get, then open the fridge, and then get your juice or something like that. You're going to change the world if you do that. Or, you know, if you're having a frappuccino, sip it. Don't use a straw, because that straw would kill a sea turtle somehow. Or conserve energy. Set your, your heater at a different temperature, something like that. These are supposed to be things that make us good people. You know, they get us closer to heaven. Now, I'll let you on a little secret. Energy is sometimes used to make things. It's not just used in your daily life. Currently, about one quarter of all energy in the US is used for industry. And we don't have a lot of industry. Please raise your hand if you or one of your direct relatives, like one step removed, works currently in an industrial capacity. If you make physical things during your daily life, OK. Um, how about anybody, two family members removed? If you have a cousin, an uncle, anybody, can anybody raise their hand? About anybody? OK, one, two. OK, so two people in this room 
even have family members who make anything. So we're really distanced from this idea of industry in the United States, which is how many people meant? Okay. So if we're actually going to make things instead of importing everything, we need a lot of power to do it. And that power can't turn on and off. Okay. Just as a reminder, energy consumption and GDP. I like this chart better, energy consumption and infant mortality. So I'll show you something. My colleague Ben Denniston had sort of extrapolated from the figures about the relationship between energy availability, energy consumption, and infant mortality, as well as energy consumption and lifespan, to work out how many years of life would be lost in the energy poorest 34 countries of the planet if their energy densities stayed where they are. I don't know if you can see these numbers. So by 2030, 15 billion life years lost in these 34 countries due to babies dying at five times the, the rate in more developed countries and at shorter lifespans, about 25 years younger than the most energy intense countries. Without energy, without the biogenic migration of atoms, without the power of fire, you just don't have advancing human society. You don't have it. You don't have it. And some people are happy about that. Oh, I'm sorry, I kind of surprised the audio guys with this. Let's start that again. I said I wouldn't have a video, but then I did. Let me know. of Germany. Isn't that great? They've got trains run by electricity. That's pretty clean, right? 40% of the power is for the trains. The heat, extra heat from the power plant was going to be piped into neighborhoods so people could just have heating without having to use a heater. You just use the power from the plant. 100,000 homes could have been heated. It's in Germany. Isn't that great? They've got trains run by electricity. That's pretty clean, right? 40% of the power is for the trains. So it was going to replace four older power plants. Germany canceled this plant. After spending a billion dollars on it, they just said, you know what, we're leaving coal. We're leaving nuclear. We don't want this plant anymore. It's, it's like built, it's like almost done. And they just, they said, forget it, we don't want it. Well, they're not gonna power. I mean, Germany has said they wanna get rid of all their nuclear and coal. Oh, the question was, how will they get power? Warm blankets? <laughs> yeah. Um, Depends on what the blankets are made out of, okay? Well, it might be bad for the environment. They're just not gonna have any power. And this is why industry is leaving Germany. Power bills in Germany are three times what they are in the US. You gotta pay three times as much for your power. Because they're saying, and Germany's not exactly a sunny place, but solar's stupid anywhere. They're gonna build solar panels, great. They're gonna build windmills. They're gonna close all of their nuclear and coal, which makes half of their energy right now. So where are they getting their energy? Well, they're importing it from Poland, from the coal power plants in Poland. <laughs> They're importing it from France, from the nuclear power plants in France. So it's just a little bit of like, it's just kind of, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's suicide is what this policy is. And Germany is just a prime case of this. You saw what happened in France when they said, oh, well, you know, we're gonna start banning diesel cars, we gotta raise um, 
the gas taxes for ecological purposes. Now, we should raise the gas taxes to maintain our infrastructure, but if it's to punish people for the sin of driving to work, that's a little bit different. You, you got to get to work somehow, don't you? And that's what people in France said. They said, we're not going to take this crap. You're trying to save the planet, and you're killing us. Right, it's the yellow vests. Same thing going on in Germany now. So if we're going to continue, as Vernadsky was so excited about, creating the glow of energy and light around the planet, how, how are we going to get light across the planet? How are we going to change dark areas, literally, of, you know, into, into developed ones? We're not going to do it with solar panels. We're not going to do it with windmills. We're going to do it with nuclear power, which you see on the right side of this picture here which is about a million times more energy than anything you could ever burn. So should we move away from burning petroleum? Yes, we should. Just like it's good to move away from burning wood. Wood is great for furniture. Why, do, you know, you burn it all, you know. Of course, you can always plant more trees. Um, you know, people like save paper. It's like, you just, paper grows on trees, literally. <laughs> paper, any, look, if you're using paper in the United States, no. This came from a tree that was planted on a tree farm to make paper. It's like food. You plant food to eat it. You plant trees to make paper. That's where all of our paper comes from, okay? So nuclear power is great. Let's save petroleum. Let's use it to make oil and asphalt and, I mean, not make oil. Let's use it to make plastics and asphalt and other things like that. We, we don't need to burn it. It's really stupid. We can use nuclear power. This is the path towards the future. So if we're going to do like the biosphere has done, it's sort of like we're sitting around here being amphibians, kind of like putting our feet on land a little bit and then kind of saying, mm, a little dry over there, I'm going back to the water. We need to move on to land. We need to be like those gymnosperms and just, you know, develop those new technologies. We need nuclear power to be mammals instead of salamanders. We need nuclear power if we're going to eliminate poverty from this planet and be able to go out and move to other planets and other stellar systems and all the great things that we ought to do. Um, that's the way forward. So when we talk about having a new Bretton Woods, what we're doing is we're organizing for the development of the noosphere. We want to increase the power of reason as a physical force. Okay? Human reason, the noosphere, the increasing cultural biogeochemical migration of atoms, the increasing cultural biogeochemical energy. This is the development of the noosphere. And we need to get together with Russia, China, and India, for starters, to organize and initiate a new Bretton Woods conference to get the countries of the world together and say that this will be our Vernadskian, LaRussian basis for measuring economic policies. You don't, money, didn't talk about money at all, did we? We talked about economy without talking about money at all. Money is a, you know, it's a thing, it exists. But you can't start trying to understand it from money. Start by understanding what makes the human species unique, what helps us live better, and how are we going to foster and develop that and work with other countries to do it. That's our goal, and it's in attempts to prevent that from happening that the initiatives of, uh, of China with the Belt and Road Forum, Belt and Road Initiative, for example, which is really creating a potential for a new paradigm on this planet, this is why these are so strongly opposed. And this is the basis for the massive, massive attacks against Donald Trump out of fear that he might commit the horrible crime of treating Russians and Chinese and North Koreans like human beings. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, so if people here have questions, please come to this microphone. Um, I don't yet have questions from anyone online, but if you have them, you can send them by email to classes at larouchepack.com. I had a question. Can I ask it? Sure. <laughs> um, on this question of respiration or interaction with the environment, uh, what about something like oxidation, rust, or th things like that? Oh, sure. So 
Well, rust is a great example. Is, is, is oxidation, like, you know, when we breathe, we're oxidizing sugar in our bodies and turning it into other things. We're like burning food, basically. We take an oxygen, we, out comes CO2, like burning wood. Now, when rust accumulates, when iron oxidizes, well, you had to have the iron first. And you don't have anything just sitting around there that could be oxidized that isn't already. So all of these materials uh, that could then be attacked by the, the atmosphere in that way, like rusting iron, we had to make the iron first. We have to make the other metals that can then be oxidized. It's essentially undoing our work. The whole creation of metallurgy is unrusting metals. So when bronze was first developed, when iron was first developed and created by human beings, we were essentially, we were adding geochemical energy, cultural geochemical energy, to minerals to create a new kind of mineral. There's a transformation occurring on the planet from ore into iron. And what caused that? What added the energy to make that happen? We did. And so now, the atmosphere can, you know, be, is very happy to suck up and, and enjoy using up that energy when iron rusts, when oxygen combines with it and turns it into rust. That's basically, that's taking away that energy that we had to spend to create the metal. So just like organisms have to keep eating, you know, to be able to keep their metabolism going, some metals like that we have to keep replacing them over time because the, uh, they get reclaimed by the by their surroundings if we don't keep adding in the energy to maintain them. You can think of that as being like the, the upkeep of infrastructure. No. Uh, one question I noticed came in on the uh, on YouTube. Well, I guess I think, like, I feel like I answered it though. Why is it stupid to burn oil if you don't believe in climate change? Um, just like I said, to save the oil for other things. Also, it's just less efficient. We'll have less human labor involved it, so here's an example. The m way that we use oil right now, home heating is some of it, it's basically for transportation. It's used in engines. We don't have any power plants that burn oil, very few that burn oil to make electricity. It's just not worth doing. So it does make sense. We'll have a more efficient transportation grid overall if we've got electric trains and things like this making up more of it. And it'll take less human labor to get the uranium, to run the nuclear plants. It'll take less human labor, definitely, to run the fusion power plants to create that energy than it is to go out and find oil and suck it up and clean it up and take it and refine it and all of this. It's just a waste of, it's just a waste of time and energy. What we're going to be able to do with nuclear fusion will make this stuff just you know, obsolete as an energy source. And that's the fraud of this. You know, anybody who was saying we've got to you know, we've got to reduce CO2 that isn't saying we need to build lots of nuclear plants. Um, well, first off, their goal is useless anyway. But, you know, they're just not, it's not honest. It's not honest. Hmm? Another question. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay, good. I have another a question online, and then we'll take this. Um, the question is... My understanding of a major difference with the use of fusion power as opposed to even fission, and actually fusion power that uses helium-3 as a fuel, is that it allows the direct production of electricity as opposed to having to produce electricity via a turbine, as with oil, gas, coal, and fission. This direct production of electricity en masse would be a paradigm shift in itself, as I understand. Can you discuss this, or am I just wrong? <laughs> Um, no, you're not wrong. I'll say something about that. It is true. It's kind of antique, but even in a nuclear power plant, which is based on the amazing fact that we discovered that there's things inside an atom, that it has a nucleus, and that if you change it, if you break apart uranium, you get a bunch of energy, and we figured out how to make that happen in a way that you cause lots of uranium to break up and make energy. That's very impressive stuff. The way we make power from it in current nuclear power plants, though, is that it just gets hot, boils water, turns into steam, and it blows through a big fan to make electricity. So you're losing half of the energy. 
heating water, making steam, blowing it through a fan, you lose half of your power right there. If there was only a way to turn the energy directly into electricity, you'd double your efficiency. And there are technologies for nuclear fusion, especially if we have helium-3 as the fuel, where all of the products of the fusion will be charged, will be charged particles. Moving charged particles is something that can be much more directly transformed into electricity than just heat, which is basically the lowest form of energy that you can get. So, yeah, if fusion power plants working on that basis will also be simpler because they won't need to have turbines and cooling towers and water and it'll be, be nice. Much easier to take on a spaceship, too. Hi, I am, my name is Michelle in New York, New Jersey. I live in New Jersey and I'm theoretically, con, you know, I think we should go to nuclear power, f fission, fusion, uh, but in New Jersey there's this whole question of the fate of the nuclear plants that I understand are decades old. They've been around, they've been doing stuff for a long time and uh, I read these articles that are coming out every couple weeks about what's going to be done about these things. The, I, don't, I don't know the details very well, but there's a debate about closing the nuclear power plants. And it seems like most of the discussion is that it's become more expensive to produce power at these plants than the all green sources of energy in the state. So I was hoping you could address that. Okay. I will not make up something. I don't know the details about Jersey's nuclear plants. I mean, in general, it's a very cheap way to make power, unless they happen to be really poorly made and need a lot of maintenance, which happens with some plants. Uh, overall, we should, oh, Diane will say something about that. I'll say we should make new nuclear plants. They'll be way cheaper. The reason why they're saying that is that solar and wind are massively subsidized and the nuclear power is not currently subsidized and there was a, a resolution in the legislature and Bruce can say more but they were trying to PSE and G our power company was trying to get a subsidy so that they can keep the nuclear plants open because obviously if we get rid of them since New Jersey's energy is at least 50 percent from nuclear if we get rid of our nuclear power plants we will be like Germany um, so that's that's an ongoing fight which looked like we were getting some progress and then a little bit of a setback but it's actually subsidies and it's really misleading because that is how they oh the nuclear power is so much more expensive well actually it's not more expensive but it is not getting all of the extra money poured in that they get for solar and wind I could probably just Google this question, but what form does the subsidies take? Is it to the companies that are producing the solar energy and the wind energy? I don't know how that works. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wait, let me just see on here. Sorry. Um, is there anything from Houston? I haven't gotten a text from them. I don't know if they have any questions. Yes. 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 I don't have my phone on me, so I couldn't tell if they do. What? Yes, we have a question. You have a question, Russell? Okay. You can get a little closer. Okay, good stop. Let's back up a little bit. Thank you, Jason. Joel here. Uh, did Vernadsky have much to say on the uh, oh, hold extra on. Term? Sorry, Joel, can you repeat? We didn't have sound for the first part of what you said. Most of it is tax credits. And no matter how much you subsidize solar, it, it doesn't work if there's no uh, sunlight or if the panels are frozen over like in Minnesota. So, uh, yeah, if on this extraterrestrial paradigm, you can say something on that. Hi, my name is Charles. I'm from Seattle, Washington. Uh, my question is for Jason. It's a very simple, yet perhaps broad question, but I would like to know your thoughts on this. Um, how did Vernadsky's ideas change how LaRouche looked at or presents his own discoveries in economics? That is an excellent question, and I would love to find out the answer to it. I, um, 
I'm sorry, I wish I could say more. I kind of just uh, didn't have very much time to get ready for this. And um, <laughs> uh, LaRue first knew about Vernadsky back in, even in the 40s. He heard of him out of the corner of his eye. Vernadsky's first book, The Biosphere, was published in 26. It was available in French in the 20s already. He, was, he lived in France from 22 to 25 and wrote The Biosphere there and some other works. So Vernadsky was sort of, he was sort of known. Um, LaRouche later received, part of what prompted him in 2005 writing that paper, Vernadsky and Dirichlet's Principle, was that he got a copy of a paper that Vernadsky wrote in 1935 called Problems of Biogeochemistry. And it lays out, so the quotes that were here were mostly taken from that. Some of the distinctions between living matter and inert matter, the biogenic migration of atoms, other things like this. And he goes through a lot of ideas about what, what some of the other differences are. So that was translated by Vernadsky's son, George, who immigrated to the US and became a history professor here. So um, I think that what LaRouche found in it was two things that I can say with certainty. One was an amazing parallel to what he had already thought. Because you know, if you read LaRouche's economics books from the 70s or works from the 70s or the 80s, he's discussing the three different phase spaces of the non-living, the living, and the cognitive in a way that's very similar to Vernadsky's. LaRouche makes the same point, that we cannot understand the living purely from the non-living. That, mm -hmm. would, would you say it, has, it would have a similar impact on his own ideas as his looking at Riemann's habilitation dissertation? Well, that's possible. I think that sounds apt. I mean, yeah, I just really, I just really am afraid I can't, can't say much more than that. Um, what it did mean was that he knew there was something to tap into in Russian intellectual circles. Because Vernadsky is very well known. And even during the periods of repression under Stalin or the periods of where there was an official scientific approach under the Soviet system, Vernadsky did not go along with that. Um, he fought against Oparin, who had basically fought against reductionism, the idea that you know, we can understand everything in terms of its pieces. For, uh, pieces. Vernadsky did not agree with that and stood up against it. Um, I just I can't say more without making things up, so I won't. Great question. <laughs> I apologize. We couldn't hear what Joel said at the beginning, so I'm going to just ask you, oh, okay. uh, which was, did Vernadsky have much to say on extraterrestrial imperative? Um, not an extraterrestrial imperative that I can recall, although he did recognize that, because in his time period we hadn't been to the moon yet. He died in 43, but we were sending planes and, and things up further and further into the atmosphere. And so Vernadsky said that the biosphere itself includes the atmosphere of the Earth and deep inside it where life is and life has changed things. And that the noosphere extends up 40 kilometers from sending up rockets and things and you know down to a kilometer in depth of boring into the Earth. He recognized that unless we got off of the planet, we wouldn't know if some of the things that we learned about life on Earth were specific to life on Earth, or life on planets, or life. And he said the only way we're going to be able to distinguish those things is to look at life not on Earth, or life not on any planet. And of course the only way to do that is to go out into space. So, um, since I don't know everything about Vernadsky's works, I can't say that he did or didn't, I'm not aware of that, but it's certainly an implication mm -hmm. of what he set as the scientific objectives for the future. Hi, I have a question for myself and one from YouTube. Um, for myself, uh, given the collapse of the US economy, industry, and infrastructure over the last 40 years, what would you say would be the required increase of energy for the United States? And the question from online is, would you consider the term nootropy? Okay. <laughs> um, so, starting with nootropy, I take it that this harkens back to Bruce's idea of dunotropy to replace entropy, and he believes that his term is better than um, non-entropic or anti-entropic, because instead of saying what something isn't, say what it is. Dunotropic. It's growing towards increasing power. So, nootropic 
I believe is actually a word that's already used for certain drugs that are supposed to help you improve your memory. So it might be difficult to repurpose it. Um, but we certainly should engage in a process of nootropy. So we'll consider that one. Uh, energy use in the US, like I was saying, just with industry, we would need to increase it by 50% for just the triple industry at current technologies. Really, we ought to have it at two or two and a half. It would have been, according to projections made 50 years ago when it stopped growing, we would have been using two to two and a half times as much energy per person today as we currently are. So we're using just as much energy per person today as we were under the Kennedy administration. Part of why real wages have not really increased since the Kennedy administration. In terms of if you look at the actual cost of having a place to live and transportation and health care and all that, people really aren't re doing much better for the most part since the Kennedy um, administration or maybe a decade after it, maybe at its peak. So that's, that's the kind of estimate that was given there and uh, I, would, I would go with that. Because part of it is, you know, having industry, but then having more intense forms of it and to improve living standards. You don't just need more industry per capita, but you need to, to change its power and what you're able to produce. So, big increase. Not going to do it with windmills. <laughs> yep. Hi. My name is Mark I, I have a question, energy. Can you see OSHA wave energy is future energy? It possible for OSHA wave energy for the future energy? Um, could what be used? Is it? Did you say wave energy? Yeah, wave energy. Oh no, we shouldn't use wave energy. This is one of these things that people say that you know, if you go to beaches and the waves are going up and down, and you could use that power to you know push something up and down, and that would make energy. Uh, no, we shouldn't do that. It's uh, that's a waste. Mid ocean, a uh, couple hundred miles in ocean, and they produce large number of ocean, 30 feet, 40 feet, or more than sometimes 60 feet. If you uh, translated this energy, I mm -hmm. think this may be very good. Uh, large number of energy may be produced. Well, I, if people didn't hear the question, you said, oh, in the middle of the oceans, you could have places where the swells are 30, 40 feet. And if you turned all of that into energy, that could be pretty significant. It's also in the middle of the ocean, which is a difficult place to use energy. There's not a lot of ways to use it out there. We can make this uh, very green energy, but we don't burning fuel. Well, the, the intensity, so let's take a look at this idea of energy flux density. And as we saw with the different kinds of like reptiles and mammals and, and birds, which fly, you know, there's more energy used in these higher forms of life. There's more energy used per gram of flowering plant than there is per gram of, of pine tree, for example. Over evolutionary time, life uses more energy. There's a greater flow of it. This concept of energy flux density, this is LaRouche's term, he applies this to power sources. And so he, just like Vernadsky noticed in increasing energy use in organisms, LaRouche said, ah, okay, one of the characteristic markers of economic growth is increasing the potential number of people, the potential population density, and increasing the energy flux density, he called it, of their power sources. So more power, yes. More intense power, yes. You can see this in the application of energy with the use of a laser instead of a, a drill, for example. More efficient, better quality, nicer cuts. You also see it in the production of power, where something like a nuclear plant, where in a very, very small area, you're producing a huge amount of power, it's more efficient in human terms than is something that's more diffuse. So if you look at creating these, these wave type things, I mean, I can look at the numbers and get a sense of it, but just it sounds like a real non-starter to me compared to what we should be doing in terms of investing in nuclear fusion research and making the breakthrough that's going to bring down the physical cost of power by a factor of 10. There is no way wave power is going to bring down the cost of power by a factor of 10. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jason. I'm Jane from New York. 
Uh, I'm going to watch this on the web again because it was so stimulating. Um, but uh, a couple of thoughts that I had, including a question, was uh, in the reference to the Bretton Woods and the giant nations of Russia, the United States, China, and India is so important, but uh, somehow that leaves another continent out of the picture. And I think it might be useful, um, had you thought about mentioning that South Africa is the only nation in Africa that does have nuclear, and uh, that they have been uh, rather uh, advanced in their thinking about use of nuclear, having been part of the BRICS. So just in terms of a more, um, I don't know, seems like more broad or comprehensive picture in describing Bretton Woods. Um, otherwise, it seems like we're leaving out a major continent. The other thought that I had is um, the question that I came with today, and I was wondering whether uh, how the brain is developed and used is a big thing in the social sciences and psychology, and certainly there's brain surgery and, and so on. I was intrigued that cognition is under no, no fear. Um, there is, uh, so LaRouche seems to look at the giant issues, major issues, important issues. I'm not in any way minimizing that. But also there is uh, research about parts of brain that can be used and consciously developed. Um, I've been reading it in um, my work with my, uh, tr uh, people that have suffered from trauma, PTSD, and so on. So there are parts of the brain that can be stimulated. And uh, I'm not talking about a, you know, a prong into the brain. I'm talking about uh, by consciousness. And you also mentioned consciousness. Somehow, this seems to be very significant. And I'd like your comments. Mm. I don't know. Rather broad statement, but okay. uh, whatever you might have to okay, add to you. that would be useful. <laughs> well, um, so let me start with that one. So on the, uh, the brain use and development, there's definitely a relationship between the brain and the mind. People, you know, if you develop brain problems, that can, of course, lead to changes in your mental outlook, your personality, or, or you know, difficulties with thought and this kind of thing. And we've seen amazing cases of people who, you know, have only half a brain, and you actually don't realize it until, you know, they, somebody who, like, until they got a, a head scan for something, like, they fell and they, like, cracked their head or something, and they did a scan, and they said, you know, you only have half a brain, or, you know, I think. <laughs> It, it's pretty phenomenal how plastic the brain is and how it's able to achieve functions even when parts of it are missing and this kind of thing. That said, it is useful to have an understanding about how the brain works and because it, of course, has an impact on your thought. I mean, drugs affect your brain. They definitely impact your thinking, too, which is why people use them, um, those kinds. So they're not, they're not totally uh, separate, and it's useful to know about the brain and... For example, it would be great to find a cure for Alzheimer's, obviously. That's a disease of the brain that clearly has mental uh, results. Um, maybe we could, well, there's more on that, I think. But, and then on the New Bretton Woods, I mean, it should be broadened. And I think LaRouche's point in initiating it is countries that know that they have a global role and that have significant populations. The United States and Russia clearly think of themselves as global powers. They, in other words, they have got like the internal cultural strength to say, hey, we're going to make a world proposal. They know they can do that. China, India, China is increasingly doing that on its own. India is 1.4, 1.5 billion people and also has a very deep historical understanding of the British Empire. Well, deep. It's only a small portion of India's overall history, but it's definitely an understanding. So I think that's why LaRouche focuses on these. I mean, clearly other countries like Japan, Korea, of course, South Africa, um, other developing, excuse me, other uh, uh, countries with, with ideas about development. It would make sense to bring them in. I think that his point in saying these ones will start it was that it specifically did not include another continent that's left out. Europe. <laughs> So, you know, England and France, which for some silly reason are sitting on the Security Council while, you know, 
is, uh, you know, India, Brazil, Africa don't. Uh, you know, this is one of these historical anomalies that should be brought to an end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. Sure. Texas one online and who do you want to oh did you yeah. you want to go okay good you and then we'll take one from Texas and then we'll take Denise and then we have one online and then if you have more get in line <laughs> yes hello um, my name is Max uh, from New York originally from Russia and Ukraine I um, when I left there I didn't really know much about Vernotsky but I recently <clears throat> met somebody from uh, the Schiller Institute and introduced me to the LaRouche project, I got interested. So I started looking up online and reading up uh, about the Institute and also Vernadsky and the idea of no sphere. So, and also in the context of what we discussed today, so it always seems to me the no sphere is kind of a, a sum total of all individuals, of humans um, that affect you know, our planet. So. It's kind of, to me, seems like a um, collectivist idea. I mean, my question is, does, it, does uh, this idea also account for how each individual is different in their contribution? And there's also the activities of humans and exhausted they leave behind sometimes is not, uh, say, very good for our planet. For example, I do agree with the environmentalist movement that the plastics are polluting our planet incredibly. Like I've seen videos online of hundreds of thousands of tons of plastic floating in the ocean. I was in Dominican Republic. I witnessed myself tons and tons of plastics on the beaches of Santo Domingo. I was in Brazil, you know, you see it all. So not all of this human activity in no sphere is good for us or for the planet, right? So. And because some of human activity is pretty stupid, when I go to the supermarket, the cashier mindlessly gives me double bag, even if for one small item, I have to tell her, don't give me double bag. And she looks at me like, huh, what? No double bag. So, so this no sphere assumes that we are all intelligent thinking creatures, whereas I'm kind of observing that it's too ambitious to assume that you know, out of seven billion people, everybody is a thinker, right? So it's kind of, um, <clears throat> all these ideas are kind of, in a way, elitist, that it assumes that everybody is equally thinker, smart, and, um, and together we're gonna mm, contribute to this uh, better increase of energy, whereas I, I'm kind of observing that I'm thinking that a lot of people, even in Russia, Ukraine, like I'm sure most people never heard of Vernovsky and nor do they give a damn, right? So how do we account for that? What does LaRouche think about, I mean, human stupidity in a way, right? That <laughs> how do you um, lead them, right? right because I mean, we can't assume that everybody is equally smart. Uh, human stupidity, I think, is also acts as a force. Um, <laughs> however, it may not be an inherently eternal one. So on, on the concept of the noosphere, different people use this word in somewhat different ways. And Vernadsky was aware of this when he used it. Um, there was one man named Teilhard de Chardin who had also used the term. And he had a, he had a meaning that was I think more akin to what you had expressed about is the noosphere like the, a collective human consciousness. Vernonsky did not try to lay out exactly what human creativity was. He tried to stick with what is the effect of it. What does, what does the noosphere accomplish? So the same way when Vernonsky talked about the biosphere, it does include living matter, but it also includes everything shaped by living matter. So the atmosphere, even in a portion of air where there's nothing living, this is still part of the biosphere because the oxygen was created by life. The noosphere to Vernadsky includes this building, which is not alive, it's not a human being, it's not conscious, but we, we made this. So we, as a geological force on the planet, we are creating fossils, noetic fossils, and this to him is part of the noosphere. Different people contribute very differently to that. 
I mean, he recognized that for most of human history, most people have had little occasion to be able to contribute to this process, something that he regretted very much. Um, let me come back to it, and I'm going to read a quote from Vernadsky, I think, on this topic. This is um, from his uh, The Transition from the Biosphere to the Noosphere. And I'll, I'll put a link to these things in the video description. One paragraph. In the course of the last 500 years, from the 15th to the 20th century, man's powerful influence over surrounding nature and his comprehension of it ceaselessly advanced, becoming ever stronger. In this period, the entire surface of the planet was embraced by a single culture, the discovery of printing, knowledge of all earlier inaccessible areas of the globe, the mastery of new forms of energy, steam, electricity, radioactivity, the mastery of all the chemical elements and their utilization for the needs of man, the creation of the telegraph, the radio, the penetration into the earth to the depth of a kilometer by boring, and the ascension of man in aerial machines to a height of more than 20 kilometers from the surface of the earth and of mechanical devices to a height of more than 40 kilometers. Profound social changes giving support to the broad masses advance their interests into the first rank and the question of eliminating malnutrition and famine became a realistic option that can no longer be ignored. The question now here, this is partly his, maybe some things he felt he ought to write. The question of a planned unified activity for the mastery of nature and a just distribution of wealth associated with a consciousness of the unity and equality of all peoples, the unity of the noosphere became the order of the day. It's not possible to reverse this process, but it bears the character of a ruthless struggle which, however, is grounded on the deep roots of an elemental geological process. It may last two, three generations, or more. In that transitional stage, amidst the intense struggles which we are now undergoing, it would as well seem less likely that there will be any protracted interruptions in the ongoing process of the transition from the biosphere to the no noosphere. Last part. The scientific grasp of the biosphere, which we now observe, is an expression of that transition. So he didn't, although he thought that that was the overall direction of the human species, he didn't take it as a given. He knew that individuals had to fight for it and make discoveries as individual people, but that he believed that this was, this should be our, should be our goal, a recognition by the concept of the noosphere of an equality of people and that we all, maybe to differing degrees, are able to contribute um, to improving the power of the noosphere. Um, and then, uh, do some human activities cause us troubles? They do, and we should stop doing things that cause us troubles. My joke about the straws is that among the plastic in the oceans, I think a very small portion of it comes from trash generated by New York City residents who can just put it in a trash can as opposed to fishing nets, countries where throwing trash in rivers is more common. I mean, the actual source of most of this plastic in the oceans isn't, isn't Manhattan. Yeah. Just as an addition to that, maybe you could talk a little bit about, for example, water bottles. The fact that we bring water bottles from Europe, uh -huh. people drink here <laughs> in Maine, versus, you know, competent infrastructure that well, water where you are. right, yeah, water bottles. Why don't we have water fountains? Why do we carry water around and ship water across the world? Um, <laughs> I personally consider it, you know, my patriotic duty to drink tap water. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I, you know, it seems to me sort of distinctly uncomradely to drink bottled water when you ought to, when you ought to improve the tap water so that it's drinkable. You know, it is a silly waste of time. It's funny. That's one of the funny things about Germany. Germans have got this weird thing, you know, that we've got to save the environment, we've got to ban diesel cars and all this. Germans have got some strange fear about drinking tap water. They don't do it. You go to a restaurant, they won't give you tap water. So people are constantly buying all these bottles of water and carrying them up to their apartments, up in, you know, buildings that don't have elevators, instead of just drinking the tap water. So, one more strange thing about Germany. Okay. All right, now we're going to go to Texas. Make sure we can hear you so we don't miss your question. 
I mean, maybe they can't hear. Um, hi, Dan. Uh -oh. It's okay. Uh, can I be heard? Can you okay. see me? Uh, uh, my question is for Jason. <laughs> um, um, so, Jason, um, uh, coming from California, uh, we are taught a healthy dose of environmentalism. Um, one of the uh, one of the events I attended at Caltech, for example, uh, posed uh, the argument of peak oil, which I, I, if my facts are wrong, you can correct me, which uh, I interpret to mean that it was determined by statistics, I guess, that at some point we'd run out of oil. But that was used as the rationale for transitioning to so-called renewable energies. Um, to me, this seems uh, it seems like there is some uh, uh, truth to that because, um, as we know, in Texas, we had a big oil rig disaster. Uh, and what I um, deduced was that the oil companies are taking greater risks to drill for oil further out into the ocean. Um, uh, it, uh, so that's my question. It's about peak oil. Um, and. Uh, Second, um, tell me if I'm thinking about this right. Is green fascist thinking a crisis of the noosphere, which causes a crisis in the biosphere in the form of uh, the oil problems, uh, fracking, for example, uh, and the destruction of our uh, food supply by the additive ethanol to gasoline? That's my question. Yeah, ethanol, that's, I'll start with the ethanol and then come backwards, I think. Ethanol is just one of these crazy ideas that's, we're told that this is a great idea, that instead of eating food, we should burn it. This is like going backwards and saying, let's start using wood to heat all of our homes. It's essentially the same thing, isn't it? Let's grow a plant and use it directly. So let's grow corn. I think something like over a third of all corn grown in the U.S. right now is turned into ethanol instead of eaten. What a waste. You're going to talk about something that's great, you know, is that how good is that for the, you know, environment? So it's a, it, it's a weird, it's an ideological problem. On peak oil, there have been predictions many times that we're about to have a crisis in supplies of various minerals. And some of them seem more, um, so let this be a reminder, please mute your phone if you haven't already. Um, That shouldn't have been so, uh, I should have. Peak oil, peak oil. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so people say, oh, we're about to run out of this mineral or that mineral or the rare earth minerals, they're all gone. China's got a monopoly. This is why they're taking over the world with their imperial belt and road or something. Um, we create resources. We use resources, but we create resources. Franking is a funny example because I'm not so sure that it's a good idea, but it just goes to show you that, you know, we, we figured out a better way to get that stuff when we wanted to. As far as other materials go, I think that because we have explored and found more oil, there is now more oil reserves today than at the time that people were warning about reaching peak oil. And the same goes for other minerals as well. You know, we're able to find new sources and we're able to create new resources to replace the use of other ones. So, you know, we did reach sort of, we did reach peak tree at a certain point, where the use of, of the deforestation of Europe was actually, it was a real problem. There were environmental regulations centuries ago, because I think in Sweden in particular, Sweden was like where everyone was, that was like the center of, um, of iron making in Europe, um, because I think there was some good ores there, but also there was lots of woods, there weren't a lot of people using it, and the way you would make steel back then was you'd cut down trees to make charcoal um, to produce your iron. So they had to say, hey, we're running out of trees. What happened? We, now we use coal instead. So, you know, you, you replace resources. So we really should, of course, move beyond using petroleum and burning it. It will seem to us as silly as burning wood, unless it's for a romantic, you know, fireplace or something, you know, but it's, it's not useful overall, or as silly as burning corn by turning into ethanol, we're going to say we're burning oil? 
Why? We could just use, we could burn uranium. We could burn tritium and deuterium and helium-3. Why are we burning oil? Let's, use, let's keep the most easily accessible stuff available and make all of our, uh, our plastics that we'll dispose of carefully. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm just trying to be nice. Hi, I'm Denise from New Jersey. Um, I love this class. I love this, uh, what you're doing with Vernadsky. Um, the reason is because the reason I became political and joined this movement over 45 years ago was it was the only movement that I knew of that said that the world needs more people. And not only said it, but proved it. And this is where I first learned about fusion. Many, many years ago, I thought by now we would probably have it. So we have a lot of work still cut out for us. But I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask and also make a statement. Uh, I'd like to know uh, about this new green deal. It sounds like they're taking a Rooseveltian new deal and, you know, putting it out there. I don't know exactly what it is, except that it is out there. Um, and also I want to mention the move in New Jersey and also in New York uh, where they want to legalize pot. Uh, in New Jersey yesterday I saw an article about euthanasia. They're going to go for euthanasia against the elderly and the sick. And also this idea that I've seen recently about late-term abortions. I'm talking about up to even nine months. Um, so you have this push being made, which is really ugly. But on the other hand, you have our movement. And we are having an impact, which I think is why all of this other stuff is just being thrust all over the place. One of the things I'm going to do when I go home is I'm going to make sure that I put this class on Facebook and ask everybody to share it all over the place. Because people need to hear this. People need to be optimistic and know what we can do for the world and not who are we going to kill next. So um, outside of that, could you just, do you know a little bit more about this new Green Deal? Is it? I can say a bit because there's not that much known about okay. it. I mean, what, you know, it's been, I read the, um, the, the press statement from Ocasio-Cortez's office, which included statistics like 92% of Democrats support a Green New Deal, although given that what a Green New Deal consists of hasn't ever been decided, I don't know how you know whether people support something that they haven't seen yet or not, but I guess they like the name. The uh, claims are they want zero, net zero CO2 emissions by 2030, from transportation, from power, and from agriculture. So I don't know how you're going to stop cows from farting. I don't know what you're going to do about those methane emissions, but maybe she has a, a plan for that. <laughs> it also said that, you know, it'll increase unionization, it'll build a high-speed rail network, which is, that would be a nice thing in itself, mm -hmm. and some other things. The, the main point about it is that you're not going to be able to do all of this with the renewables. That's the thing. And the point of it is to try to pull together in a very sick and disgusting way the idea that being green is progressive. Like progressives used to care about progress, about people living better. That, that's kind of the word. And eliminating poverty, helping people who were, you know, with, with health conditions, this kind of thing. That was progress. And now progress has become, oh no, that's actually like a weird kind of Western idea that we ought to have that kind of development and really we need to reduce our footprint and that's our main, our main goal is not to exist or to get as close to that as we can. That's progress. So it's basically poison. It's saying, look, we are going to make the world better and we're going to solve all of our problems by drinking poison. So you say there's no connection between some of these goals you're wanting to achieve and the means that you're taking to do it. So it's, it, it's, it's a physical impossibility to try to achieve this energy transformation. It's a complete waste of time, and its origin is to prevent economic development. That's the, the point of it. I mean, in many places, you know, this is something that I talked about before, about how environmentalism has been used as a new form of 
something akin to colonialism in Africa, for example, to prevent development, where the World Bank will say, oh, yeah, yeah, we better not build that infrastructure, it's bad for the environment, sorry, you know, we're not going to help you on that. You want to build a coal plant? Nope, we don't fund those anymore at all, sorry. Build a windmill. So it's just, it's just a, it's kind of a, it's a disgusting way to prevent development and to reduce the world's potential population. It's horribly pessimistic. Well, yeah, because what's the image of mankind that it embodies? So, I mean, if you believe the world should only have one billion people, and if you really believe that, you better not sit on your butt. What are you going to do to make that happen? And so some of these people, they said, well, I'm not going to sit on my butt. I'm going to make the stupidest economic plan you ever heard of. We're going to sh close down all of our power plants in 10 years. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it's crazy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, sure. Would I be able to take this out or? I think we... How you doing? Um, I'm Omari from Staten Island. And you could say it's a more of a rhetorical question because, right, if you say with this Green Deal, whatever he's talking, they were talking about, they say no nuclear energy should be used, right? You know. The one that Kaiser Cortez put out said no nuclear, yeah. Yeah, but then isn't that, wouldn't that be a contradictory statement, especially since our U.S. Navy, most of our ships are nuclear powered? Uh, yeah, it's definitely one of the many contradictions. Yeah. Yeah, because they'll you, a ship can last for twenty to thirty years before it needs to be refueled. Right. Yay. So now they're telling you that, because it's like, okay, you can use nuclear energy as much as you want, but you, no, not you. You know. So it's 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 rhetorical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's contradictory, right? Yeah. At the very least. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I was you know, bringing up. It's true. And contradictions are a great way to help people think in new ways about concepts. Because if you, when you help people, when, if, if you have a point of view and someone else has a point of view and they're just different, well, maybe, you know, maybe they'll listen to you, maybe they won't. If you help people realize that two things they think disagree with each other, well, they can't let that go as easily. So if someone supports the Green New Deal, let's say, and they have some idea of what they think that might mean, you can point out something like that and say, well, do you think both of these at the same time? <laughs> All right. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, let me check something okay. here. All right. Sorry, we have a whole bunch of, of good questions that just came in online, I, but one of them might be related to something you want to say, so I might ask it, but what are you planning to, are you going to say anything about the brain things or something else? No, something else. Okay. Go ahead. Why don't you go ahead, but I'm going to ask you one of the questions okay. because I think it can be folded into the others and then there's some other ones and we should okay. probably end in about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, this question is, in the current political climate, it seems they look into the past to see what worked rather than looking into the future. Could you address this idea, how do they differ? Which I think is something related to all of the questions. So I don't know if you want to hear from Ernie first then, or... They're probably different. Yeah, I'm just yeah. going to go with this one. Okay. But yeah, do people look at what worked instead of what will work? Unfortunately, right now, people are looking at things that never worked in the past and proposing them. So look, looking at what worked in the past, that would be a step up, in my view. It's not far enough. We should, of course, look where we want to go and make that our plan. But that's part of why LaRouche calls his proposal a new Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods happened in the past, and there was a real good intent behind it. And, you know, worked pretty darn well compared to what we have right now. So use that as a reference point. But it's a new Bretton Woods. We got a, you know, uh, we have developments that we can make today that just didn't happen or were not politically won at the original Bretton Woods conference at the end of World War II. So, um, yeah, it's okay to use reference from the past, and uh, ones that work are, are the best way to go. They are not enough, however. You're right, and that's why for decades the Schiller Institute. The LaRouche movement has been putting forward a plan for world development and for economic concepts to guide that development, something that LaRouche has been doing for decades. So, and he's always been very clear about saying that he has an economic approach that he wants to guide economic policy making that goes beyond what Alexander Hamilton or Roosevelt or Lincoln did, for example. 
Uh, my <coughs> name's Ernie. I'm in New Jersey. Uh, you, you brought up quite a while ago how maybe Bernadsky question is how Renazzi contributed, you know, to LaRouche's thinking and also his way of presenting ideas. And one thing that's notable is that, you know, in, in science textbooks you read about this and that law. But what LaRouche talks about more is physical principles, which is, is, has a different connotation. You know, the idea of a principle also expresses an intention in the universe. And um, in terms of Renazzi, is, I was a couple of things. One is that he has remarked sometimes that that Vernadsky, the study of Vernadsky helps very much to clarify what he's saying about the economy. And um, this question you brought up of Dirichlet's principle, I think Lewis is also talking about how you have these three domains, you know, the non-living, the living, and the cognitive. Each, he talks about being bounded by a principle and that that principle determines what goes on is possible to go on, you know, within that, um, within that domain. So I think that's, uh, uh, th I think that uh, Bernatsky, his study of Bernatsky has contributed, you know, to his uh, thinking about the idea of universal p physical principles. Now one way which he very much distinguished himself from Bernatsky is this, he said that Bernatsky talks more about how we discover principles but LaRue said a universal principle isn't really one until we use it mm -hmm. to, you know, to improve our condition and increase our, our numbers. So it's sort of a voluntaristic notion of, of a universal principle. And he writes that in this book that's worth people looking at, The Economics of the Noosphere. It's a whole book mm -hmm. where, which LaRue basically de dedicated to elaborating you know, his ideas about Vernadsky and Vernadsky's um, you know, Vernonsky's uh, significance, so, anyway. So. Mm -hmm. Good, that is, that's helpful. Uh, on Dirich, hmm, well, let's just, yeah, we'll take, we'll take that contribution and then go to the, uh, well, just well, one thing about, again, because Vernadsky, I think part of, LaRouche's reference to Dirichlet's principle and Vernadsky's discovery method, um, the same way that Vernadsky talked more about living matter and what it does than about what life is, I think that in a similar way, Vernadsky recognized that it was social man that creates the noosphere, that people, of course, have to cooperate and work together um, to make things happen, to implement a thought. Um, Anyway, I'm just adding that, yeah. <laughs> I think it's about time to wrap up and we just got one more question which I'm going to take the liberty of asking you. Uh, there's a couple online that we haven't been able to get to, so please, Jason will get them and he can respond to you. Um, otherwise, and some of them for people who are coming to the Schiller Institute conference, uh, you will have opportunity to discuss many of these matters there. Uh, so the question, Jason, is on uh, cultural transformation needed to increase the noosphere. What's the relationship of the cultural development of the individual to society as a whole that increases the creative or noetic process? Okay. Um, it's a very good question, and I've got a quote from another paper by LaRouche, I think addresses that real well. Um, I also noted that there are a lot of people complaining about their tap water on the YouTube comments. I, I understand that some places you can't drink the tap water and it tastes really gross. My point is that we should improve, that Bruce's point was we should improve the tap water so we can take the convenience of just to get a drink of water instead of carrying around water, which already carries very well in the pipe. Okay, so um, cultural development. Here is the, um, this is from a paper LaRouche wrote called On the Subject of Education um, in 1999. He says, this is part of a response. Um, One must utter classical poetry or song as Furtwängler conducted. One must not recite the text either from the written copy or from memory of the written text as such. One must deliver a recomposition of the experience 
of the original composer's final version of his or her original composition. This means that one must speak and sing not from mere memory of the interpreted text. One must unleash those cognitive processes which are reflected in the original composer's composition of the poem or song. The singer of the poem must become for himself or herself and for the hearers the living cognitive process of composing that poem. So that is a performance of a song, the recitation, well, I don't want to restate as I'm, I'm going to restate it, and you know, it's not, you know, he speaks for himself, but I'm going to speak for myself as I understand that. That in, in the recitation of a poem and the performance uh, of, a, of a song, that what ought to come across is the fact that it's almost as though you are rediscovering the creation of that piece of music or of that poem. But that should come across. When a composer writes a piece of music, when somebody makes a discovery, it's to fulfill a certain need. Something's missing and you're creating something to, to achieve it. I think this is really similar, this goes to culture, this is really similar to the idea of a, of a discovery. You know, Ernie talked about physical laws versus a principle. People learn laws of mechanics and this kind of thing. People learn theorems. The Pythagorean theorem about the sides of a right triangle or about squares arranged in the form of a right triangle. In some of his papers, LaRouche says, when you say Pythagorean theorem, do you mean that relationship between the lengths of the sides? Or wouldn't it be better if when you say that word, what really comes to mind as the referent was when you discovered it, or when you taught it to somebody else and helped them discover that that relationship is true? So that this concept, this theorem, really shouldn't lose the fact that it was a discovery. Now, if you're using it, you know, if you're like doing some you know, carpentry or something, you don't have to maybe think about it every single time, of course, but that, that's, in, that's inherent in the concept. The same thing with, with, a, with a poem or something. It had to, if it wasn't necessary, maybe it didn't have to be written in the first place, um, but if it was, then that necessity ought to come through, that it was needed to achieve something. Culturally, people should be familiar. We should have young people familiar with where society came from, for example. With that, another quote, once a child has recognized that he or she has relived moments of discovery from each of many historical figures, especially discoveries of ideas which approximate a universal principle, the universe becomes a nice place in which to be born, to live, and ultimately to die. Today's greatest single obstacle to even a rudimentary comprehension of the issues of educational policy is that for most adults living in the USA today, the central issue of a competent educational practice is not even known to exist. That issue is the nature of the fundamental difference between mere learning and actually knowing. So a basis for culture in which people have sung choral music together, work through discoveries of the past together, socially, and recognize in their mind an affinity with these thinkers of the past, a connection to the past, to the future, to a sort of timeless simultaneity that exists outside of the moment, that's a culture in which people are able to understand their existence as a human being. We live outside of time. We put up those three phase spaces before, the non-living, the living, the cognitive. Biological time differs from the non-living in that there's these different kinds. Generational time, just the like, active time of eating some food or something, evolutionary time, that it has a direction to it. Well, we have a different kind of time. I mean, for us exists the moment. The moment doesn't really exist for the non-living domain. They're all the same. Same with biology. When you have free will, the moment exists, a different kind of time, a time in which you can judge your actions in eternity. As we heard in that beautiful speech that Will had played from LaRouche last time, at every moment, 
when you make a choice and the moment that you have, you can always think, 50 years after I am dead, could I look back and say that I did what was necessary, that my life had a necessary contribution to humanity. And if that's the basis of our culture, um, I, think, I think people get along pretty well. Pretty well. We'll be a lot happier. And we'll have a great economy. People won't be poor. <laughs> That'll be nice. Okay. So with that, we will conclude. Thank you very much, and we'll see you all soon.